that you had an interest in participating. Uh, so you said I know that. Did you hear? Is that okay? Mm -hmm. Okay. <coughs> I know my voice is a little on the far side, but I want to make sure you I, I don't think we have to be in a consent calendar today, so no. I'll save that for next time. Uh, we do have the scholarship uh, uh, from the Josiah Bartlett, but I'm sh I see Shelly Allen is here, so I'm sure we can speak to that when he comes in. But those were provided for you as well. And, are you ready? A hearing on Senate Bill uh, 372 and Paul Thompson. <laughs> Copies of the amendment, and uh, there should, should be a stack of them here for, for any of the members of the public that would like to see it. Uh, the amendment completely replaces the bill. Um, it's obviously very similar, but there have been some uh, changes, some clerical changes, and some kind of programmatic changes. So I'll just speak, all my comments will be directed specifically towards the amendment, the amended version. So I'm not going to go on at length, I think, about uh, school choice. Um, school choice is something that um, some other members of the public, uh, other members that are going to testify today to can testify as to the, um, how effective it is. Um, there's been a number of studies done on it and shown its effectiveness pretty much universally. So uh, it's a very well-researched topic, very well-respected. Uh, so, but the, but the idea here is to do education tax credits for the benefits of parents to be able to send their kids to the school of their choice. Um, in, in this case, SB 327, um, and then there's a companion bill in the House, HB 1607, which are identical, with the only exception being means tested, which is in the Senate version. Uh, but, but this program is designed to uh, give a tax credit against business profits tax or business enterprise tax uh, if you donate towards a scholarship <coughs> organization. The amount of the tax credit is 90% of the donation. Um, that's a change from the original published version. And then the scholarship organization can give out scholarships that average of $2,500. They could give out less uh, for students who don't need it as much or whose tuition is lower, or they could give out more. Uh, but it needs to average of $2,500. The child can go to a private school, an independent private school, or they can do, uh, actually based on a request from uh, some of the, super, for at least one superintendent in my district, um, go to an out-of-district public school. So if a uh, child that goes to an out-of-district public school, the sending district can choose to accept that and allow the adequacy aid to follow that child. However, if they refuse that, then there's no state aid um, and no local property tax going to that child and the parent has to pay fully out of pocket. And that does happen. Um, and so this, this would allow, in that case, where no adequacy aid is going to that student, the, uh, uh, they could receive one of these scholarships to go to an out-of-district public school. Also, scholarships can go towards homeschoolers um, that uh, up to $1,500 to cover expenses, uh, books, materials, tuition if they want to drop into a community college course or a single course or get <coughs> um, And uh, that amount is capped at $1,500, and we do exclude paying homeschoolers, the parents themselves, to do the education. We just don't feel that would be appropriate to set up some strange set of incentives to pay people as a home school as opposed to just reimbursing materials. Uh, the initial size of the program is capped at $15 million in donations. At a 90% credit, that means $13,500,000 in tax credits. Um, the program is designed to be revenue neutral. The way, the way this happens is that we require a certain percentage of uh, the scholarships to go towards children that are currently in public school and would have been counted in the adequacy aid in the subsequent year. Um, because there's a two to three year time lag in the adequacy aid that this does exclude first and second graders from being counted in that percentage. Um, and, and the percent in this bill is 70%. So 70% have to come from existing students in, in public school that would be counted for adequacy aid. Um, I'll call those from now on just switchers. <coughs> 
then um, there's a section 11 of the bill um, on page uh, 7 that for those 70% of those, student, th those students, uh, the, the scholarship organization by two weeks prior to September 1st, the first adequacy day, two weeks prior to that, the scholarship organizations need to notify the DOE of the intent to give these kids scholarships, and the DOE would then subtract uh, those, mem those, those students from the ADMR calculation used to provide the grant for that year. Um, so if, if the child is on free reduced lunch, that would be the 3450 plus the 1750. If they were special ed, they would add that as well. But that would get, get subtracted out from the grant. Um, there's been some questions about this in terms of the statewide property tax. Uh, we've looked at the statute very carefully. Uh, this doesn't affect the statewide property tax at all. It doesn't reestablish donor towns. If there is uh, a town, and there will be towns, that get no state aid, all of their funding comes from statewide property tax. Uh, in that case, they would still get no state aid. Um, we wouldn't be subtracting anything from them, um, in which case we're not saving money in, in, in that case. But that's about 6% of uh, funding goes towards towns in that situation. So, um, and, and that's actually been included. That, that, that um, effect has been included in, in the fiscal that I'll talk about in a second. Um, so, but on average, so the, the students that are switchers on average, we give uh, state aid of $4,100. If you look at, you know, the percentage of people on free and reduced lunch, percentage of special ed, that average is out to, to be $4,100, a little over $4,100. So at $4,100 saved per child in adequacy aid and 70% coming from that pool and $2,500 scholarships, that winds up making a program that becomes uh, slightly better than budget neutral in the first year, saves roughly um, $900,000 based on, on certain assumptions. Um, so as I mentioned, the Senate version adds uh, means testing. The means testing that we put in there is 300% of the federal poverty guidelines. Um, that places a cutoff at about the median income in New Hampshire. So this, this, that, that keeps this as something that's not targeted towards wealthy people, but yet at the same time, um, is broad enough to offer support for, for lower middle class and, um, and poor people. We do add, because we've seen in other states that there have been problems with means testing like this, where there may be a family who's had a medical emergency and has a lot of out-of-pocket expenses, or their income on their last 1040 was, was uh, above the means tested amount, but now they have lost their job. And, and they're at risk of having their kid uh, not be able to attend school. So we allow for a uh, we allow for 20% of the grants given out or the scholarships given out to be exceptions to the means test to allow for that kind of situation. Um, you know, means testing the House doesn't have it. I think there's going to be a lot of debate about that. Um, there's going to be some testimony after me that talks about there are states that do this without means testing, and that turns out to be more popular to the people because um, it's a universal voucher, and they see that I think is more fair. Um, and then the states that don't have means testing, it winds up going to poor people anyway. Uh, we don't have to tell the Salvation Army who to donate. I'm going to skip Jason's thing. We don't have to tell the uh, Salvation Army to donate to poor people. That, that's what they do. Um, so it may not be necessary. So that's a good topic of discussion. Uh, in terms of fiscal impact, uh, the DOE, Mike Schwartz, is here, I think. Uh, it's, it's been kind enough to work with us um, to try to get an accurate fiscal, uh, fiscal note. We, they can't do a fiscal note for the amendment until it's adopted. So this is not an official uh, fiscal note, but I do have, you should have copies of um, New Hampshire Department of Education calculation details. And then there's a spreadsheet that should be next to that. So, so first off, critical assumptions is, I, I talked about section 11, which um, deducts funds from towns. He, talk, he, he talks in this about um, towns like Alton that don't receive grant funds. So this just explicitly lays out that, that that's the intent. Um, there's some questions about language. I talked to legislative services. The language should be fine in order to not create donor towns. Or not should be, it is fine because 
Even if you subtract something, you can't donate a negative amount. It doesn't require reverse payment. But we could uh, make the language a little clearer in that respect, and, and I'm happy to do that. Um, but the fiscal notes assumes that the language is, is good. Um, and then, and so if you go to the, the second page of the text version, it's got the fiscal impact. Um, so they have, the, for, for first, and, and he, he did some calculations based on HB 1473, which is an alternative uh, way to do adequacy payments that's uh, being heard in the House right now. Um, that bill reduces the base amount of adequacy aid, but then increases targeting towards communities. Um, one of the problems with that with respect to this bill is, is if you reduce that adequacy amount and target the community, that, that money that's going towards the community is not tied to, tied to the child anymore. Um, and so we don't save as much um, if people switch. There's, there's less money tied directly to the child. And, you know, the Senate version that I created last year was, I think it was good about that as it targets the child directly. Um, you know, if it's free and reduced lunch, there's a certain amount of money attached to that child. Um, so the net impact for year one, uh, is, is, without HB 1473, is a positive $900,000 to the state. Um, the lo local net impact for the towns is a loss of revenue of 12,200 uh, loss adequacy payments. If you look then at, at section five, it talks about uh, estimated impact on the expenses, because that's just the revenue side. So th their, their adequacy payments would be reduced by that much, but they're also not educating those children anymore. And you know, there's a lot of debate, de debate and discussion about the variable cost for, for schools. Um, and we're going to hear some testimony later that talks about some studies that, that show that the variable cost tends to be 70 to 80 percent based on some studies. Um, there was a study by Josiah Bartlett Center that looked at this uh, by Brian Gottlieb uh, in New Hampshire specifically, and I think it was in 2005, and that was the variable cost they saw was like five to six thousand dollars. But um, you know, this is this is something that does happen, admittedly, unevenly with schools. If you have a school that has a large uh, large number of students in a given class, if you reduce the number of students, that, that's not going to change the number of classrooms. However, in other schools where you may be right on the borderline of having, you have a low number of students per class, you have three classes, maybe with 13 or 14 kids, dropping a couple of kids could allow you to consolidate classes you have a big savings. So in, in theory, it should average out over, over the districts, but um, it, it would be a little bit uneven. Um, with, without being able to consolidate classrooms, then uh, what, what um, Mike got from a number of superintendents is looking at the cost to be about uh, 500 uh, per pupil, and that's you know for books and materials. I think where that cost is coming from. Um, in terms of looking at the impact of localities, one thing to keep in mind too is the size of the program. 15 million dollars. This is a 15 million dollar program, and we spend between state and local localities about three billion dollars on education. So this is a half of one percent in terms of the total money spent spent on education that we're talking about. Um, plus, there, there should be some cost savings, you know, 1,500, 500 by the low end over the amount of adequacy paid being at the high end. Um, some other program notes are that uh, we do a couple other things. We allow the program to grow over time if it's successful. If, uh, if 80%, if there's donations that equal 80% of the tax credit amount, that's a slightly different number. The tax credit amount is 13,500,000. dollars So if we get if we hit 80% of that in donations given and given out to students, then the program can increase by 25% the next year. So it will only increase if it's if it's successful. Uh, the cap at 15 million dollars was something that you look at that would expand. Uh, that could expand private schools by 10 to 15 percent. Um, that's probably a reasonable amount, uh, a reasonable maximum amount, since you know you can't expand schools that quickly. So we probably, you know, even if there was demand from the student side, there would, probably wouldn't be able to, the private schools probably wouldn't have the capacity to, to deal with more than that anyway. So that's why we, we put a cap in the 50 million dollars. Um, which gets into the other issue that we dealt with is if you look at the donations coming from the businesses and the credits going out to the children, they're not necessarily directly linked. You could have businesses that are very ex excited about the program and donate a lot of money, but then maybe there isn't demand from the kids. Um, 
or vice versa, you have a lot of kids asking for scholarships, but there's not enough money coming in from, from the businesses. For that first example, if we get $15 million in donations, but only $5 million worth of scholarships are demanded, um, then we have a mechanism in there, and we're, House Ways and Means brought some issues with the language we have, so we're look, look, looking to, to clarify that, but um, the intent here is, if that happens, that excess funding would come back to the state to make sure that, our, that the program still remains budget neutral. In the first year, all of it would come back to the state. In subsequent years, the scholarship organizations would carry over 10% to the following year, just to allow you know, for some flexibility. But we thought, given the budget constraints this year, it was very important to make sure this doesn't impact the budget. Um, and, and, and actually, talking to Adam Schaefer of Cato, he, he sees that you know other programs have a similar kind of mechanism in other states, but it hasn't wound up being triggering, getting triggered. The, the scholarship organizations tend to try to spend the money they, they, they get. Um, in terms of fiscal note, I will say that um, there's a number of things, uh, calculations in there. I think it, it's proved to do it this way, but there are a number of calculations that, that are kind of worst case scenarios. Um, for one example, we took the average, or Mike took the average of $4,100 per student. But if you look at st uh, programs in other states, and then also in our in our case, if we do means testing, it's more likely that we'll get more towards the lower lower side poverty end. In which case, we're more likely to have more people that are eligible for free and reduced lunch, which would drive the average up above $4,100, since that's $1,750. Um, also, yeah, one, one other item I didn't talk about. So the 70% of the scholarships in the first year go to switchers, but the dilemma there is is we have first and second graders that aren't necessarily counted towards that. And then also, if you have incoming kids coming to first grade, we have no way of knowing if they would have gone to public school or go directly to private school, we can't really account for that. So over time, this program needs to just be opened up to everybody, not just switchers, and so we shrink that percentage down from 70%. <coughs> next year goes to 60%. Increases by 10% each year until it's down to zero, so that anybody anybody is eligible. Um, now that uh, so the fiscal note for the future years assumes that that we go from 70. It assumes you only get 70% switchers. The other 30% are either incoming, you know, first second graders or existing private school students. <coughs> uh, so that is a worst case assumption. That that probably is is realistic, I would think, for the first year. But as that percentage goes down, I think, um, you know, I think that, that we're more likely to have a lower number of switch, I mean, I'm sorry, a higher number of switchers than we are required. But this assumes that we only have the required number of switchers. And we also make the assumption that if someone switches from public to private school in one year, they've saved the state adequacy funding for that year and, and, and the localities. But in future years, we're also going to count them as being switchers because once they moved, they're still saving us money because they're still still in private school. And so again, that makes it easier and easier to meet that those uh, percentage guidelines that are coming from switchers. Um, so the, I, I think as this fiscal note gets further and further out in terms of number of years, uh, for example, in the second year, it's looking at a 1.1 million dollar um, expenses greater than rep, you know. A net outflow of 1.1 million dollars. Um, basically, the revenue has gone down more than we've reduced the expenses in that case. And then in, in year three, 3.9 million dollars. I think as that as those fiscal notes as we get further and further out, that's that's more and more of a worst case scenario. We should expect to do better than that. And a number of other states with these programs have seen a, a positive fiscal impact. I mean, intuitively, if you look at it, we're spending 14,500 per pupil in New Hampshire on average. Giving a $2,500 scholarship, um, you know, to relieve that burden from the state and the localities should be a money saving. Uh, um, and that's that's pretty much it. I've, I've gone on in a lot of detail. And I apologize for the amount of time, but I don't think questions at this point would be good. Thank you very much. Uh, questions for the committee. I know I've, I've just seen this amendment and just looking at this fiscal note, so there's a lot to sure. look at and to digest here. Uh, I haven't had an opportunity to read all the 
new element of material. So I'm just going to ask you a broad question, which is just, what what are you really looking at a want as an outcome of this legislation? Yeah, and, and some of the others. The people that are going to speak are going to talk about what the studies show, but the, but the idea of the outcome is to, first of all, give parents choices in how to educate their kids, whether that's an out-of-district public school, a private school, or homeschool. Um, currently, wealthy people have that option. They, they can choose any school they want to if they're wealthy, um, but, but poor, lower middle class you know, can't really afford it. They, they've paid their taxes. Um, they don't have the excess funding to do something like this. Um, so this gives everybody or extends that option down. Um, so that's that's the whole goal. And then in terms of effectiveness, what we, what, what they see in, in terms of choice programs in other states is they see an improved quality. And what's interesting is they see an improved quality in terms of test scores, for example, in the kids that use the programs and, and exercise the option to go to a, a private school. But they also see improved test scores from the public schools themselves. You know, Milwaukee's had a voucher program for I think 20 years. It's been a long time. And, and that's what they, they saw is they saw that you know, there was a lot of dissatisfaction initially. They had a lot, of, a lot of kids leave. As the public schools then started to compete for those dollars, they'd make improvements, they'd improve themselves, <laughs> and things kind of stabilized. And there, there wasn't that mass exodus um, of, of kids from the school. So the goal here is to improve the quality of education for both, both private and public school kids. Um, a side benefit bit of that, a side benefit of that can be potentially a cost savings to the state and localities. Um, but for me, that's not my primary goal. Um, but we, you know, to get this, to get support for this, we did structure it to be budget neutral. Further questions? I think probably when we get to executive session, we'll have some. So we know how to do it here. So. Thank you.